Thank you, Andrea, Janice. Hey, thanks to you guys, too, out there. You know, there's just a few of us. You guys looking around? There's just, just a handful of us, but boy, it was really good during worship. I could hear you guys singing. Kind of reminded me of uh, a coyotes, Brother Todd. I mean, just one or two of them, you know. It sounds like a whole big pack. And you guys sounded so good <laughs> this morning. No, much better than coyotes. <laughs> hey, second, uh, second Chronicles. Chronicles. Second Chronicles chapter 7. We're going to look at verse 14. We're going to look at just three words in verse 14, ultimately. But I want to start with 2 Chronicles 7, 13, and do 15, and, and go through that. Now, let me tell you about the message this morning. The message this morning is kind of a, a, a rally, kind of a rally cry, kind of a, this is what you can expect, and prayerfully consider joining other Christians as we come together to pray for our country. Our country is in trouble. We have all kinds of issues in our country. You know, if you would just look at the natural disaster, when's the last time you've seen two hurricanes come at the same time at our coast? What about all the COVID stuff? Are you guys getting tired of COVID yet? What about the wildfires in California? Man, we, we're really struggling. We've got lots of issues. And those are, those are more natural kind of issues. We have other issues like Antifa, uh, Black Lives Matter, defund the police, all those kinds of issues going on in our nation at the same time. We've got all kinds of uh, reasons, good reasons. To seek the Lord. Amen. Let me invite you to recognize what God's Word says and then commit to action. Let, let me call you to prayer. Call you to prayer from you personally to God asking Him to intercede on behalf of our nation. Today I'm going to teach the first of two points in this this verse, verse 14, and call you to prayer. Saturday, the remaining points will be covered in different prayer groups at prayer stations. Each prayer station will be led by a leader. Each prayer station uh, will happen in its own little room in, inside our church. So we're going to meet at 1030, potluck brunch. Then after the brunch, we're going to move in small groups from prayer station to prayer station and at each one of these prayer stations guys you probably never heard of anything like this before but it's okay I promise it'll be, the Lord will be glorified if we're meeting and praying his word and that's exactly what we're going to do so we're going to move from station to station each station will have one of these points of 2 Chronicles 7.14. Today, again, I'm just going to go through the first two uh, points. At the end of that, those uh, rotations through our prayer, uh, prayer stations, we're going to come together in the sanctuary for a time of repentance, renewal, and praise. After that is complete, we're, our, we're scheduled to be done at noon here. Then at 1 o'clock, we're going to meet with our county at the courthouse and we're going to pray for our nation with other Christians who will be meeting us there that day. I pitched this, we're, our church is behind this, we're the ones that have organized this, this countywide prayer thing at the courthouse and I pitched it to the ministerial alliance and they're like, yeah, sign me up. So there's four, maybe five other ministers who will be leading prayer at that event and after we pray for our nation as a, a community, I, I really do. I think that there will be lots of other people there from lots of other churches. That's this Saturday uh, at 1 o'clock. Uh, after we do that, we're going to either walk or drive to the school campuses and pray for teachers, students, administration. Uh, we're going to pray for our kids. We're also going to include Eastern Oklahoma State College uh, in that. So... You know, my recommendation is if you're going to pray at the college, go ahead and drive uh, out there. But uh, 
It's just different that we look at a, a passage of scripture in our worship time together on Sunday morning, and, and then you're invited to come back and finish that up by praying that scripture back to God in little prayer groups. Guys, that's very different. But let me encourage you to prayerfully consider doing just that. I honestly, I know, I just know God's going to bless you personally, and I know that God's going to bless our church, and God, I believe God's going to bless our nation as Christians unite around the truths of His Word and pray His Word back to Him. So, uh, chapter 7, verse 13. Would you like to stand in honor of God's word? If, if so, please, please join me. I'll, I'll read it. When I shut up the heavens, this is God speaking here to Solomon. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain or command the locusts to devour the land or send pestilence among my people, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayer that is made in this place. Heavenly Father, thank you for being our God who wants to meet with us. God, we, we met here this morning to worship you and so we have a desire, Lord, to meet with you and yet we know at the same time you desire more to meet with us. Thank you for loving the unlovable for loving us while we are yet still sinners, trusting in the precious blood of Jesus. Chapter 7. So, Father, help us to focus on you. Help us to repent. Help us to pray. God, would you help us to humble ourselves. We ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So this morning, what we're going to look at, you may be seated, we're going to be looking at these three words, if my people. And of course, 2 Chronicles 7.14 is one of the best known, probably the greatest love verse in all of Chronicles. It expresses, as does other verses in the Bible, the stipulations that God lays down for a nation to experience His blessing. Whether that be Solomon's nation, Ezra's nation, or the stipulation that God lays down for the blessings that would come to the United States of America. Those who have been chosen to be His people must cease from their sin, turn from living lives of self-centeredness, pray to the Lord, and yield their desires and their will to His Word. Then and only then will He grant a heaven-sent revival. That's exactly what we're after here. That's exactly what our nation needs. Where the individuals who take on the name of God, we call ourselves Christians, when we actually repent and act like Christ in front of our nation, when we sacrifice, when we make sacrifices ourselves, and act like Christ, that's when, he, that's when he hears. Can I give you some historical context? By the way, this passage is rich in historical context. In 2 Chronicles chapter 1, we see Solomon establishing a firm rule as king over the nation Israel. And God appears to Solomon in verse 7. And he says these words, Ask what I shall give you. Now what would you say if God said, you know, whatever you want, just ask. Here's what Solomon said, and you know it very well. He said in verse 10, Give me now wisdom and knowledge to know, to go out and to come in before this people. For who can govern this people of yours, which is so great? Now you recognize God gave Solomon that wisdom. You remember that wisdom was first challenged by the two prostitutes. These two prostitutes both delivered babies at the same time and one rolled over on the other, smothering it in the night. And So the woman with the dead child 
replaced the dead child with the living child in the middle of the night. And when the woman with the dead child woke, she looked at the dead child and she said, this is not mine. And so the matter went all the way to the Supreme Court, you might say. It went all the way to Solomon. And so Solomon listened to both sides. And then Solomon called for the executioner to come with the sword and said, split the child down the middle and half will go to one woman, half will go to the other. And immediately, one woman cried out and said, no, 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 no. <laughs> Give the other woman the child. Solomon said, there's your mama. The woman who cried out for the life of the child. His wisdom was firmly established. And you can see that wisdom when he said, God, this is not my people that I'm king over. This is your people. You see that all the way back here in chapter, chapter 1, as Solomon asked for wisdom. Solomon then set out to build the Lord a temple. He asked King Hiram of Tyre, send cedar, send cypress, send your, your greatest craftsmen because I'm building a temple for the Lord to dwell in. It'll be a place for His people to reunite with Him as they repent and as they offer sacrifices to Him. He will meet with them there. But we see that in chapter 2. Then in chapters 3, 4, and 5, we get all of the details of Solomon's beautiful, rich temple that including all of the gold, all of the furnishings, it, it just amazing in splendor. All those details through, verse, through chapter 5. And then in verse 6, I said chapter 6. Then in chapter 6, Solomon dedicates the temple to the Lord. He explains to all the people what they're doing there and why it's so important that the Lord come and, and dwell in the temple and that the people meet with Him there with sacrifices. And then he offers a prayer of dedication. So, the Bible describes quite clearly that Solomon had a, a large platform where he was standing as he addressed the people. But when it comes time to pray, to actually talk to God and give the building to God and ask for His blessing, Solomon, this all, you might say all-powerful king, he gets down on his knees and he lifts his hands to God and he prays. And I, I, I want to just share with you just a piece of that prayer. Just one part of it. In 2 Chronicles 2, in 2 Chronicles 6, 24, if your people Israel, Solomon prays to the Lord, are defeated before the enemy because they have sinned against you and they turn again and they acknowledge your name and they pray and plead with you in this house, then hear from heaven and forgive the sin of your people Israel and bring them again to the land that you gave them and to their fathers. So in humility, Solomon's asking the Lord to show up. Asking the Lord to dwell there, to meet with the people. Now, let me just give you a little sideline here. Just, just, just a little bit of piece of information. God desires to meet with you personally. God desires to speak to you personally. God cares about you individually. He could do no more than what he did, sending the Lord Jesus Christ to die on the cross so that your sins could be forgiven. He desires to have that kind of a relationship with you, where you call him Father, where you cry out, Abba, Daddy, and where he responds. And so Solomon cries out for the people that God would bless this temple. How does God respond? 2 Chronicles 7 verses 1 through 3. Now this is just a few verses ahead of the one that we're looking at in verse 14. As soon as Solomon finished his prayer, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices. 
And the glory of the Lord filled the temple. And the priest could not enter the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord filled the Lord's house. When all of the people of Israel saw the fire come down and the glory of the Lord on the temple, they bowed down with their faces to the ground on the pavement and they worshipped and they gave thanks to the Lord saying, For He is good, for His steadfast love endures forever. Wow! God answers from heaven with fire. Filling the temple with smoke. That's quite a response. And it also assures the people that God has answered the prayer here of Solomon. You know what happens next? After all these 15 days of, of feasting and the dedication of the temple that night, Solomon, he goes home and, and later the Lord meets with him and speaks to just Solomon. The Bible indicates that the Lord appeared to Solomon and spoke to him. You know what he said? He said those verses that we read. He said, if my people, if my people. God spoke to Solomon. Here's something that we need to keep in the back of our mind. God desires to speak to us. You know, it, it would do us well if we would ask ourselves the question, what's keeping me from listening for the voice of God? What's preoccupying my life at work or my life at home or my social life? What is keeping me from getting still and listening for the voice of God? God is speaking. The question is, is are we listening? So the Lord responds with, If my people who are called by my name. The if there is a condition. It is conditional. It is an if-then statement. If then. If we humble ourselves. If we pray. If we seek. If we turn. Then. Then. God says, I will hear. Then I will forgive. Then I will heal their land. Do you see that conditional? If then. So this past week, my grandmother, if she were still alive, Christine Vincent, if, if she were still alive, she'd be 104. I remember as just a child, she loved to sew. Maybe she didn't love it. Maybe it was necessary in that generation. But she sewed a lot. She even made hunting clothes for my dad and some of my uncles. I think, I think some grandkids received uh, some hunting clothes as well. She had this old Singer sewing machine. And always next to that machine and next to her little bobbins and her little spools of thread that she had around there, there would be a, a can of three-in-one oil. You guys... Any of you remember 3-in-1 that used to come in a little metal can with a little red tip on top? Okay, well, she always had that by her sewing machine. So she would keep that sewing machine oiled up. It was probably old then. And what, what she would do is she would oil that machine and she wouldn't have any problems with it. Boy, it would just sew just like clockwork. Click, 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 click. That would work great. But if she failed to oil the machine, then the machine would bind up and stop sewing. It was an if-then situation. If she serviced it or if she oiled it, the machine would work. If she didn't, then the machine did not work. God is telling us right here, if we will humble ourselves, if we will pray, if we will turn, then our machine will work well. Then He will hear. Then He will forgive. Then He will heal their land. We've got a lot of issues in our... Can, can I just... You know, I don't want to go, go around hunting different uh, hardships and say God has brought those onto our country. But when you have two hurricanes hitting the Gulf Coast at the same time, I don't know. Does that cause you to scratch your head saying, could God really be bringing some kind of judgment? Or could He be trying to get our attention? When we've got a worldwide 
pandemic going on? Could God be trying to get our attention? When we have so much unrest, there's never been a time in my lifetime where I can remember so much unrest. Could it be that God is trying to get our attention through all of these, all of these different ways? Well, what we see here back in Solomon's day, if there was a pestilence, then the people could go to him and repent. If there was a disease or a plague, did you guys did you guys read that with me? Did you guys did that ring a bell with you? Then my people could go. See, those kinds of things have happened in the past. Am I saying that those all these natural disasters and the problems that we're having today are definitely attributable to God? No, I'm not saying that. But based on the historicity of the Scripture, I can't rule it out either. You understand what I'm saying? If my people, what's he talking about here? My people, he's talking about Israel. If my people who are called by my name, God chose Israel, delivered them out of Egypt. My people. But what about the USA? Are we the people of God? Are we who call ourselves Christians? Are we who meet together on Sundays to worship Him? Are we who pray and spend time with the Lord daily? 